Thank you for whoever put this uh, itinerary together. It's a nice uh, follow-up to Emma's talk. Uh, so who do we not have to look for atrial fibrillation at all? And is there, are there groups uh, where anticoagulation might make sense? So to kind of frame the issue, you know, we're going to talk about stroke prevention and prevention of embolism. Uh, there's also some of this work which looks into things like heart failure, hospitalization, and broader cardiovascular events, but we won't focus on that perhaps. Uh, we're speaking specifically about people without known atrial fibrillation, although as we have learned from many of the implantable monitor studies, uh, many of these patients actually do have uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation, just don't know about it. Uh, we'll talk broadly about anticoagulants, but this will also include uh, low-dose DOACs in combination with uh, aspirin, for example. And here are the main populations that I thought would be interesting for this short talk. So the ESIS population, for sure, high-risk, stable cardiovascular and vascular disease, uh, the heart failure uh, world, and then just older individuals with CV risk factors. So it made sense uh, back early, you know, patients with cryptogenic stroke might uh, benefit from oral anticoagulation because of the implantable trials that found a high uh, prevalence of a high incidence of uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation, up to 30% of patients following a cryptogenic stroke. And uh, this led to the hypothesis that you could just empirically treat. They're high risk. They just had a stroke, so it doesn't get much higher risk. And you see a high incidence of atrial fibrillation over time. Now, we've had a couple of trials presented, uh, published, and one in the, uh, in the enrollment phase. Uh, these are the data from Navigate ESIS, so great concept, Bob Hart and Stuart Connolly uh, with this trial, but unfortunately, empiric treatment here with rivaroxaban did not reduce uh, stroke at all and uh, was associated with a two-fold increase in major bleeding. So uh, that was disappointing that this might have been the first group that would benefit from empiric therapy. Uh, with respect to ESIS, the, the story is a little more complex. This is the Bigatran versus aspirin, uh, similar size trial. Uh, you can see the overall result, again, just fails to meet its, uh, its uh, primary efficacy um, uh, threshold, although bleeding was uh, much more equivalent between the two strategies. Uh, and then the tantalizing thing that gets dissected from this trial is maybe there's a, a trend for benefit amongst older individuals uh, and uh, patients with longer-term follow-up. So uh, no clear win right here, right now, in the ESIS population, but some tantalizing evidence um, here with respect to ESIS. The last of the three trials, the Arcadian trial, is ongoing. This is a slightly enriched, quote-unquote, atrial myopathy population. So to get in, you need an ESIS event, plus you need something else, either an nt pro over 250 or a left atrial diameter index over 3.0 and you can be randomized to apixaban uh, versus aspirin. So that trial is ongoing. So that's it for ESIS at a high level. So uh, would have thought that would be the first group uh, that would show a, a clear win, uh, but not to be, at least not yet, and we have to understand more. On the other hand, this was the other trial that came out right around the same time, COMPASS. As you know, these are high-risk individuals with stable chronic coronary disease or vascular disease and uh, they were randomized to one of three arms shown up here. And you can see on the overall primary outcome of the trial, you see uh, benefit for the combination of low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin. But what's interesting is when you dissect this down, and this has been dissected even further, uh, you can see here uh, the unexpected 42% reduction in stroke. Uh, Bob Hart's recently presented some data on this, and it seems to be across the board uh, ischemic stroke reduction, so uh, cardiobolic, large vessel, and even lacunar stroke all seem to go in the same direction. And with the size of this trial, of course, you have ample statistical power to help tease that apart. But this is really, uh, you know, a, a bit of a surprise that there was this big an impact on stroke with that intervention. Uh, it's not an anticoagulant like we think about uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation trial, uh, but something about the combination of low-dose DOAC plus uh, aspirin uh, clearly had a benefit here with empiric treatment in terms of stroke prevention. Again, many of these patients, as I'll show you in a few slides, would have had atrial fibrillation. Of course, this was not measured in Navigate for fear of having a uh, massive rate of crossovers if we had uh, standardized uh, implantable loop recorders, for example. And then finally, here in the heart failure population, Commander HF, again, the hypothesis is that thrombosis was, uh, is intimately involved with the progression of disease and a variety of cardiovascular outcomes. So again, using that uh, compass-style RIVA 2.5 VID uh, compared to placebo in patients uh, with heart failure, 
And again, you can see here the negative uh, primary outcome, uh, but this tantalizing effect uh, here on the right uh, in terms of stroke reduction here in a heart failure population. A little bit different than some earlier warfarin trials in the HEF-REF uh, population, but uh, again, a, a DOAC fixed dose and overcoming some of those challenges with those earlier uh, clinical trials. Now, what I was saying earlier is if you look into the COMPASS population of high-risk vascular disease or the Commander HF population of uh, heart failure patients, if you look hard enough and long enough, you do find a lot of atrial fibrillation there. So again, the thinking here is perhaps we're treating subclinical atrial fibrillation, although that's just one hypothesis. Of course, we could be just treating uh, anything, and uh, we don't yet have any uh, proof because none of these trials have implantable devices to know who the patients in Compass or Commander were that had uh, the stroke reduction. Was it concentrated in these folks that had subclinical atrial fibrillation, or maybe it was not? And uh, we don't uh, really have sufficient data to really make that conclusion. Um, the last point I'll make is when we're dealing with high-risk older individuals, uh, there's a background rate of stroke uh, that will not go away with anticoagulant therapy. So this is uh, the RELY trial, 150 BID of dibigatran here in the lower line. Uh, good trial, these are patients, good drug to prevent stroke, taking it in the context of a clinical trial, and you hit a floor effect of about 1% per year stroke rate when you're talking all-cause ischemic stroke. So, you know, when we're dealing with subclinical atrial fibrillation or atrial high rate events, like Pallas and I do in our clinical trials, you know, those patients also have a very low rate. And I think when you're dealing with older individuals, there is some rate at which these stroke events become unmodifiable, uh, at least with uh, straight up anticoagulation as we use it. So I think the jury would say right now that <clears throat> DOAC does not reduce stroke in ESIS patients, at least the broad group of ESIS patients. I think there probably will be a group within that, maybe 15 to 20 percent, where there might be benefit. And uh, we'll see if Arcadian can prospectively validate that or not. Uh, Low-dose DOAC and aspirin does reduce stroke in patients with, uh, with uh, chronic stable coronary disease and vascular disease, uh, also the low-dose uh, DOAC regimen in the heart failure population, but we don't know how it's doing that. Uh, the role of uh, subclinical atrial fibrillation remodeling is uncertain. And I think, again, we simplify this, especially as cardiologists, we simplify uh, what stroke is about. And I think there are a variety of different stroke mechanisms at play. These patients can have all or any of them. And uh, I think uh, that's important to consider and exactly what's going to happen here with low-dose stoac and aspirin. Uh, time will tell over the next few years. So thanks.